for that unscripted, unplanned, <laughs> unprovoked, unrequested burst of applause. <laughs> it's so amazing to be here in my home state of Oklahoma, an atheist of it. I uh, said in my autobiography, I said, you know, in Oklahoma, you normally see two things. You see tornadoes and churches, and the tornadoes are easier to escape. That's how normally I would say it. <laughs> that you would spend part of your lunch hour with me. Thank you, I'm so glad you're here. And I wanna say thanks to American Atheists for allowing me the privilege and honor of being a part of today, okay? So my friends, in uh, 12 days, I'm turning 50, okay? No, 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 don't clap. You'll encourage it, right? You'll bend space and time and you'll make it appear sooner. It's funny, just out of morbid curiosity, I downloaded one of those aging apps to my smartphone. Have you seen those? You take a photograph and you, uh, you do an aging app to see how you'll look in 20, 30 years. Um, and check this out. <laughs> That's harsh, man. <laughs> that is harsh. I look at the wrinkles and the age spots and that kind of old curmudgeon that's featured in the photograph and my first thought, you know, it's not a big leap from that to Clint Eastwood <laughs> in Gran Torino, you know, he's this nasty old mean guy that says, get off my lawn, that kind of guy. Has the mid-century mark caused me to stop and reflect? Well, yes, it has. And for that reason, the first part of the monologue is going to be, unfortunately, necessarily a little bit self-indulgent because I want to reflect a little bit about my own life, which means talking a little bit about myself, and then I'm going to sort of springboard off of that. So if you'll take the journey with me, I do have a destination. You know, when I look back across the decades at my younger self, you know, I, mostly I just want to shake it. I, I was a very religious guy, and I was, I was always in motion. I just want to grab the young me and say, dude, what's your hurry? Like, what's the hurry? Here, there, here, there, up, down, go, 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 never stop, always in motion, can't wait. I have, uh, I have a couple of great, uh, Natalie's children are my stepkids. They're like my own children, 20 and 23, and I watch them, and I'm like, they're amazing. You know, they go to a job, and oh, then we're going to catch a midnight movie, and then we're going to go to a friend's house, and then we're going to get in a car and go to another friend's house, and then we're going to sleep for 30 minutes, and then we're going to go here, and we're going to do a concert at Red Rocks, and we're going to drive all these hours, and we're going to have that, and we're going to come back. And, and I'm just, uh, you know, I'm just blown away by it. And as I watch these young 20-somethings just going here, there, here, there, I utter what has become sort of the slogan of my life, which is, y'all have fun. <laughs> Right? Y'all have a good time. Drive safe, buckle up. All right? Go easy. Come home safely. We'll see you soon. That's been my motto as of late. More proof that I'm getting older. Every day, it's like a science fair experiment looking in the bathroom mirror. You know? <laughs> it's an experiment in being less young. Like, I don't feel old. I'm just less young. <laughs> you see these lenses? These are called progressive. Anybody know what progressive means? <laughs> trifocal. <laughs> I have to wear trifocal glasses. I still love pizza. 
but pizza is now a whole cost benefit discussion. <laughs> you having pizza? Oh, I'd love it. How many? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> How spicy is it? What time of the day is it? How much of it's going to end up locked against my belt line? That kind of thing. I mean, this is my idea of a good day right here. <laughs> Sit back kick it back. I'm slowing down. I mean, as much as I try to prevent it, at the age of almost 50, the day's coming up on the 12th of April, at almost 50, I mean, I'm, I like my music softer. I like, I like to just lounge around in my pajamas. I look forward to an uneventful evening, don't you? Oh, a nice uneventful time. And life really starts to become more about the little things than the big things. I saw something online made me chuckle. It was a, a play on the old uh, Folgers commercial that said, you know, Folgers got it wrong. The best part of waking up is going to back to bed after you pee. <laughs> yes, the best part of waking up is going to bed after you pee. Uh, another funny observation about getting older I thought was great. It said it's kind of funny how when you get older, you miss the things you hated as a child, like naps and getting spanked. <laughs> but I have no further comments <laughs> on that. I don't have an Instagram. I don't Snapchat. And while I use social media, I'm on Facebook every freaking day. I've been informed by Generation D Z rather that Facebook is for old people. And maybe I have it coming, right? Every freaking year we'll watch part of the Grammy Awards and I have to ask somebody in the room who's 20 years younger than me three or four times, who's that? Who do they sing? Oh, have I heard that? What station's it on? <laughs> it's happening. I play video games occasionally for fun. I'm not great at it. Started a Twitch channel. When people ask me about video games, I think of <laughs> the old Atari 2600. It had a joystick with one button. I can keep up with one button. I watch and enjoy documentaries. I will watch a documentary about anything. I saw one recently, it was about the rise of ISIS. I saw one about Kim Jong-un and the impression of North Korea. There was a great one on HBO with Anderson Cooper and his mother, Gloria Vanderbilt. Watched the whole thing, a compelling. There's, it's a great documentary about Carol Spinney, the puppeteer for Big Bird. It's called I Am Big Bird. It's fascinating. It's such a good movie. It's such a good documentary. I don't really drink. And yet, I've seen twice a documentary on Master Sommelier's wine experts. It's called Somme on Netflix. I, I watch it every time. Somme. I love documentaries. I've been informed that my forehead is actually a five head. <laughs> like extra sunscreen has to go up there all of a sudden. What happened? People are very sweet, though, when we talk about it. It's like the old line where they say, you know, don't think of it as losing hair. My friend, think of it as gaining face. <laughs> Beginning of this year, I was walking upstairs and I heard a horrible sound under my right kneecap. It sounded like gravel under there, a grinding sound. Natalie, did you hear that? Yeah. Oh my God. What do you think that is? I don't know. So I call the doctor, have him check me out. We do the x-ray. He walks back in without blinking and eye, tells me what it is. He said, oh, it's arthritis. <laughs> no. No. No, it's not. It's not arthritis. I'm not even 50. It's not arthritis. It's something else. <laughs> the breakdown of cartilage so the bone rubs against bone, specifically osteoarthritis. Shit, I have arthritis. <laughs> Decades ago, I would have thought this impossible. But then if you look at my life right now, if you look where I'm standing right now, there's so much about my life I would have once considered impossible. I mean, I'm speaking at the American Atheist National Convention. If you'd have told me when I was a true blue, died in the wool, Jesus-loving broadcaster, that I would one day be here, I'd say, no, it's impossible. That's never supposed to happen. My whole life at midlife is really something that was never supposed to happen. Just ask my parents, okay? <laughs> now, when you're a child, especially a child in a fundamentalist upbringing, a fundamentalist religious upbringing, a Christian culture, 
You are told by your parents, you can grow up to be anything you want to be in this world. And this is what we tell children. Parents are like, you can be anything you want to be in this world if you commit yourself. And then they commit themselves completely to limiting our options. Okay, I want to be this. Uh, I don't know. No. I'd like to do that. No. I was in third grade at Sandberg Elementary School, a public school. I went home and told my folks what we'd learned about Neanderthal man. You know what's not in the book of Genesis? Neanderthal man. And within a blink of an eye, I was in private Christian school, right? Because I could have grown up to be an expert. I could have grown up to be a uh, you know, an anthropologist or an archaeologist, a paleontologist. I could have done anything. But no, 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 let's, let's actually, let's limit the options and let's put them in this little pod, all right? You can be whatever you want as long as it's this. And if you don't, the often, uh, well, the often damaging message is that, well, you're, you just screwed up your life, kid. You blew it. You're worthless or your life has been wasted or you're bad or you're bringing a shame. I've heard a lot of these in my own. Not that I'm worthless, but that you're an embarrassment to the family. This is not how we raised you, those kind of things. Well, how did they raise me? If I can, my friends, and again, I know this is a bit self-indulgent, but take the, take the journey with me. Back to my fourth grade year at Temple Christian School, that is me. hair parted perfectly on the side and a collared white shirt with a necktie on because it was photo day. But this is also how we dressed for Chapel Wednesday. They had a church service every Wednesday. Now, if you'll notice, on the necktie, it may be difficult to see. There are American flags all over the tie. And that's because of the direct link that Christian cultures have between God and country. We are a Christian nation in God we trust. This nation belongs to Christians. We see it quite a bit, especially now in the state of Florida after Parkland, it's tragic. And I had Christianity everywhere, Christian school, Christian lessons, Christian prayers, Christian chapel services, Christian pledges. You've heard of the pledge to the uh, American flag. You may not know that there's also a pledge to the Christian flag. Now, we said this in my youth, and I could still recite it. We would stand up every day, every day as young children, we put our hands over our hearts and say, I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior for whose kingdom it stands, one Savior crucified, risen, and coming again to give life and liberty to all who believe. It's been decades, and I still remember it. Tell me that it's not effective to get them while they're young. But we still weren't finished, because after we pledged our allegiance to the Bible, or after we pledged our allegiance to the Christian flag, we pledged our allegiance to the Bible. And there's a pledge for that. Guy would hold the Bible out, one hand over, one hand under, and say, I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word. I will make it a lamp into my feet and a light into my path, and I will hide its words in my heart, that I might not stand against God. I'll remember it till the day I die. Fourth grade, do you think I had any, any idea what an allegiance is? <laughs> I mean, what, what's an allegiance? I don't know. But we were taught to recite it and make the pledge and make that promise and dedicate our lives. I pledge allegiance. I pledge allegiance. I can grow up to be whatever I want to be as long as it's this. I remember Christian school. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and it was like that. Bible lessons, chapel services, prayer before every class. You know, Seth did such a good job on his memory verse. He's such a good son. He participated in chapel. He's a student leader. He's such a good son. He got an A on his New Testament exam. He's such a good son. We're so very proud. He's such a good son. Let's transport forward to my high school graduation. Look at this kid. Look at all that hair. Look at that skin. I mean, I'm like, oh to go back 30 years, it's just, oh, not a blemish in sight. I don't think it's just the soft focus. I really do think I was just lucky, you know. It looks like Joel Osteen. That's better than the other one I've usually heard, which is Bob Saget. I'll take, the, I'll take Joel Osteen over that. 
This was Joel Osteen. I'd be up here promising you blessings from on high, and then I'd have a plate already circulating every <laughs> single row. But I mean, think about me, a product of this fundamentalist home, surrounded in affirmation, student council leader, Youth for Christ. I loved Christian music. I knew all the lyrics, went to all the concerts. We prayed Christian prayers before every meal. We had Christianity reinforced all the time. And so as I enter adulthood, I could be anything I want to be. It was a natural progression for me in the year 1990 to start in Christian radio, which I thought was amazing. My parents could not have been prouder. I mean, imagine, he's a minister of the gospel. He's playing music about our faith. He's a known quantity. He's kind of a mini celebrity in our hometown. They could not have been prouder. This is me about 10 years after that. Morning show host for KXOJ 100.9 FM. We played Christian music, and I happened to join the radio station at a time when Christian music was really starting to flourish. At the time, the fastest most the fastest growing format, radio format in the country by far. We played Amy Grant, Stephen Curtis Chapman, Michael W. Smith, those kind of things. And, and it was, uh, you know, I, I honestly felt that uh, so assured, like, you know, wow, this is really serendipitous that I've got this job and I'm ministering the gospel and I'm doing the right things, and blah, 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 just reinforcement. Now, I was an able young man with a gift for communication, and so this career made sense. I'd grown up to be whatever I wanted, but if you've noticed, they'd narrowed my options, narrowed my options. And so I was able to be what I wanted within a very narrow spectrum. And this is quite often the way children are raised. Many of you in this room, I know, have lived this. And if it's not religiously, maybe it's politically. You vote differently than your mother and father. This is not how we raised you. If you choose a life partner, or love someone they don't approve of. They say, this is not how we raised you. If you declare that you no longer believe the religion of your family and culture, they look at you like they failed as a parent. You failed and they failed and they say, this is not how we raised you. Yeah, you could be whatever you want, as long as it's this. I was the epitome of that Alejandro Jodorowsky quote. It says, birds born in a cage think flying is an illness. Why leave when you've already arrived? Why look outside when everything is already here and it's pat and it's simple? I had the answer with a capital A. It would take more than a decade after this radio photo was taken in the 90s before I would discover the world outside the cage. I was in my late 30s and I finally, finally started to grow up and to explore who I was. Who am I? What do I think about this? Not what does this book think, or what does this dogma say, or what do my parents expect me to believe, but what do I think about things? And I finally realized and gained the courage to explore who I really was, and it was thanks to the encouragement of other people who had walked some of the same steps. This is a uh, current photo of me, right here. <laughs> I am the black sheep of the family, <laughs> you know? Uh, and if you ask my father what any of his children do, he'll proudly give the answer, unless that child is me, and then he gives you that look, which is Clint Eastwood from <laughs> Gran Torino again. And I'm surrounded by the platitudes, you know what, one day I know you're going to come to the light, you're going to see you. I'm, you know what, I'm praying for you. Anybody hear this one? I pray for you daily. I'm praying for you, I'm going to pray for you. I pray for you, which is, in many cases, an, an honestly sincere Sort of, a, uh, it's a desire to help because of how they have been religiously brainwashed. And in some cases, they're saying, God, please help that terribly stupid atheist realize how right I am about everything. Amen. Right? <laughs> and then they say the most hurtful things to people in love. You're living wrong. I say this in love. You're an embarrassment. I say this in love. You know, you're damaging the, uh, the reputation of the family, the family line. I say this in love because I care about you. We failed as parents. You're a failure as a son. Why can't you just be quiet about your atheism? Why can't you just keep that to yourself? I mean, why do you have to be so vocal about it? Essentially, most of it comes down to, it reminds me of that scene in Game of Thrones, right? Most of it comes down to shame. <laughs> Ding. Any Game of Thrones fans? Okay, I knew I liked you guys. So I'm almost 50, almost 50. My parents and I really don't even speak. It's interesting though, they do send me one religious Christmas card every single year. 
it's overtly, hugely religious. It's got verses, and unto us a child is born, and Jesus is the reason, the only reason for the season. We love you and whatnot. It's always interesting to see those because the underlying message, quite frankly, is uh, congratulations on your blood pact with <laughs> Satan. Right? It's all very passive aggressive. Look, you know, I had to draw a boundary in my life, or I chose to draw. I still don't even know if it's the right move, but I just got tired of other people telling me who I am. So I'm going to be 50, and I'm in this weird place where I sort of, a few years ago, 10 years ago, sort of introduced me to myself. Hi, you know? Hey, let's go and find out what we think, not what we're expected to think. And then all the dominoes started to fall once I released my belief in the Bible and got over my fear of hell, which took a couple of years. Everything else started to fall away. I changed my position on so much. Gay marriage was one of the first. The death penalty totally reversed. I used to be totally Old Testament about the death penalty. Um, I used to be a Fox News Christian, you know, back then. I was that guy. Rush Limbaugh listening, Michael Savage listening, Ann Coulter reading, Fox News Christian. You know, and everything, everything started to fall away. And I saw myself in many ways as a, as a different person. Certainly a different person than what they expected. This is not how we raised you. This is not how we raised you. You're not doing it right. You're not fitting in. You're not blending in with us. You're not reaffirming us everywhere you go. You're different. You're just too different. I hear that quite a bit. Has anybody else heard that and can relate to that in this room? Bunch of you, okay. And I really wish that just for a second, my parents could peek through some of these other doors with me and see what I'm seeing. Like if I said, hey, would you like to come to the American Atheist National Convention? I mean, you might as well, they'd be out in front with garlic and torches and you know, <laughs> priest and you know, whatnot, probably dragging a big cross around the perimeter of the block. I mean, I don't know what they, I'm exaggerating. But I mean, they would see only the label. They would not see you. They would not see you, the human beings, the, the people who love life and want to help other people and just want to do the right thing and want to defeat bad ideas and promote good ideas and want to connect and feel the privilege of being alive. They don't see that. There's so much more out there. I really wish they could just look outside the cage with me for just a few and just explore such, such an amazing and better, much larger world. I discovered a world where I was not born broken with a sin nature worthy of hell. I discovered a world where I didn't waste this life waiting on the next life, where love was a beautiful expression of humanity that we can do on our own terms. It wasn't a divine edict under threat. It was okay to doubt. Hell, it was encouraged to doubt and discover and make every day an exercise in curiosity where I could live on my own terms, love on my own terms, and explore and learn on my own terms. And anytime, anywhere, I could open any door I choose. Now, why would I want to go back? Has anyone ever asked you that question? Hey, if you could go back to the matrix, <laughs> when things were easier, wouldn't you like to just plug back in when everybody's not shaming you and it's not controversial when you put a conference billboard up in the city in which the conference is being <laughs> held? You know, I mean, how crazy is that? You know, would you ever want to go back? Let me ask you, would you ever go back? No! Hell no! No! way would I want to go back. You know, I look at my life today as I, I'm certainly a little older and a little less agile, but I, I'm just struck by the wonder of it all. And so many people never break out of the cage. They never get the chance to really tap on the glass and see what else might be out there and to discover the world that they have discovered. And so here at this age, I've never been more comfortable in my own skin. I've never felt more like me. I've never felt like I was having to, I didn't have to jam the square peg of religion into the round hole of reality. I, I mean, I get to make every day an honest discovery based on, on merit. I'm more aware of the world around me. I'm, I'm less prejudiced about other people. I'm more accepting. I'm happier. I, uh, I'm, I have more purpose now that it's self-generated purpose than I ever had when it was handed down to me from on high. Why in the world would I ever want to go back when I'm so thankful to be alive? And so if anyone asks me how I spend the occasion of my 50th birthday, you know, I'll, I'll tell them I spend it the best way I could think of, you know. I, I spend it free of my cage. And I work every day to try to encourage other people, to 
to look outside the cage and set themselves free. And as I look out of all of you, I'm profoundly grateful for who you are. You talk about goodness. I've seen more goodness in the last 12 hours just being here. The people who are just genuinely good. We were at breakfast. Natalie and I were at breakfast this morning. And it was cold in the, in the restaurant. And Natalie was shivering and she left her jacket upstairs. And a woman named Belinda was sitting just 10 feet from us. And she had just bought a sweatshirt, a, a sweatshirt at one of the tables. And she came over and said, here. And so Natalie puts the sweatshirt on. And, uh, you know, she didn't have any reason to do that. She just did it because it felt good, because it was humans helping humans. What's interesting is Natalie's not an atheist, but the shirt said, this atheist votes. I thought that was awesome. <laughs> I was trying to get pictures. And I was, <laughs> When I'm at the table, I had a woman come up and she was a, a fresh apostate, you know, she'd just come out and she needed to be reminded she wasn't alone, she broke into tears. And we just hugged, you know, it was crazy. It was just like this connection between two people who'd never met. There are people here from all over the United States, maybe out of the country. And you know, when we come here, we, we support each other, we are family. I uh, don't have a, a great relationship with my folks, let me just tell you a quick anecdote if I can. Uh, one more demonstration of what I see every day and I try to communicate every day. I was in Wichita, Kansas, I think this was two years ago, and I was up there, and uh, a woman named Brenda apparently is familiar with my situation and the fact that things, you know, I, I go home for the holidays, but we don't really, we don't have a great relationship. And she walked up, and she said, she looked me right in the eye, and she said, if I was your mother, I would be so very proud. <laughs> and we just, we both cried, and we hugged, and we had this moment. I thought, what an amazing gift. No gods, no dogmas, no superstition, no magic, no nonsense, no threats, no shame, no guilt. Just humanity, just human beings helping people. But I want to go back. No, you know what? I'm going to be 50 in just a few days. And I spent this day the best way I know how. I'm spending it among friends. Thank you all very much. I want to respect your time, but I would like to hear from a few people. There are two microphones up front. If there is a comment or question that you have, this would be on the radio, the caller segment of our broadcast. While we're waiting, today's high will be 70 degrees, partly sunny skies. Don't forget uh, to be listening tomorrow morning at 720 for the secret song of the day. When you hear it, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I went back into radio mode. All right, this will be the listener uh, comment and question section. Hi, what's your name? My name is Aura Elavinia. Welcome. What Thank can I do for you? What's on your mind? I'm an independent documentary filmmaker and for my entire adult life have made Christian documentaries, conversion stories, this whole thing. Nine months ago, I changed my brand to the real storytelling filmmaker. Last week, I aired a documentary about a Christian minister turned atheist. That was my coming out as well as a non-believer. <laughs> But this new life is challenging for me. This is my first time experiencing an atheist culture, non-believing culture. So my question to you, if I can flip it, I'm the real storytelling filmmaker, what's the real story of humanity? Well, you talk about a broad question. <laughs> the answer is 42. I love the fact that this is a culture of Douglas Adams fans. <laughs> I love it. Well, look, I, I'm not a great philosopher. My, my coda, for lack of a better way of, of saying, when, when, I, when I see a young person coming from a culture where they told me what to think, I always say to them, you know what, make every day a discovery. Sometimes I'll write it as, when I autograph the book. I'll say, uh, you know, make every day a discovery. And I think, when every day is a discovery, we are then allowed to live our lives honestly on our terms. And so we haven't said, I'm going to, this will be my answer. We can make the day about discovering what the answers are. And if, you know, we discover new evidence, we can change our minds. There's a liberation to that. 
in the larger sense for me, I have, you know, stepping out of the tribe. Anyone notice when you stepped out of religion and you begin to accept and see people and love people and appreciate for who they are and the more different they are from you, the more awesome it is? You know, I, I feel more connected to humanity these days. And so for me, it's, it's all about humanism. It's trying to make the world a better place, trying to embrace the best ideas, apologize for my mistakes. Uh, remember that there's no evidence for a life 2.0, so let's maximize every moment. In fact, the reason, the fact that I don't believe in a heaven actually makes this life so much more precious and critical to me that I, I just want to carpe diem, carp, it seize the day, and that would be all I got for what it's worth, okay? Thank you. Yes. Love you, Seth, but you said you were bringing the dogs down today. Where are they at? Oh, uh, <laughs> Uh, Henry and Rat Dog, I brought them to the convention. I'll have them at the table. If you buy a book or a mug, I will let you. No, never mind. I'm just uh, we brought them. Yeah, I brought them. They're three and a half pounds. Rat Dog's real name is Tootsie. And we, we, since we drive, we were able to drive the highway. Both dogs are here. And they were a little overwhelmed. You know, there were, people were all coming at them. But I'll have them back down here later this afternoon. Please come up and, you know, and wink at them. They're just precious. Henry's a rescue. And Tootsie's been with us for about 11 years. And they're both darlings. Go ahead. Hi, um, Susan Schindler. Have you, ev I'm sorry, have you ever, since you've been on this side, um, have you ever gone back to any of the social media places like Fox News or all the other places that you mentioned earlier? Have you ever gone to their uh, sites and said, you know, I really used to love you guys, but like I woke up? I mean, have you ever made that announcement to them uh, that they lost you? I normally won't go to a, uh, like a, a religious comment section to to talk about the fact that I hey I used to think what you guys think and then I woke up and I'll do that but I, I do I will if someone makes a false claim and they often will do it about atheists I will step in uh, there was a uh, Oklahoma politician who was uh, did a whole post on his Facebook page a politician elected to represent us all and he spent the whole post talking about how this is one nation under God. We're a Christian nation. The founders were Christian, and God we trust is on the money. Uh, the, the under God is in our pledge. And so I just I went on that page and just point by point said, well, actually, this is factually wrong. This was changed. This, this was not in the original pledge. The coins changed just after the Civil War. It was printed on the money in the 50s during the Red Scare under God. Was not, it was a, the Constitution's a secular document. Just point by point. I just refute it, and I'm like, you know, it, you're, you're supposed to know the Constitution, right? <laughs> and the uh, comment was immediately deleted. Um, and other people had gone on and they grabbed it and posted it and they all reposted and just reposted the same thing over and over and over again. <laughs> Until I think, I think was it uh, somebody at FFRF or someone else I think tapped him on the shoulder and said, actually, I think it's illegal for you to s sort of subjectively delete your, uh, you know, elected uh, the people who you were representing deleting their comments and so now I think they, the comments may still be there, I do not know. But normally it's, it's usually a refutation of a bad idea that's presented. Yes? Hi, my name's Lindsay. Hi. I'm kind of conflicted sometimes about like telling people I'm an atheist. Not in the terms I don't think you should, but like at work I think you shouldn't talk about your religion. I don't think it's appropriate. But then at the same time, I'm like, I can't wait till they find out I'm an atheist. So <laughs> my question is, how do you balance telling people you're an atheist when you're safe to with being like, maybe we shouldn't talk about this? Like, Are you safe? I mean, do you feel like oh, yeah. there'd be consequences? No, I don't think so. But I just also you, don't think it's- You don't think so? I mean, I mean, I think I'm safe is what I meant to say. <laughs> all right, well, I'll give you my stock answer for what it's worth. And I don't have all the answers. I'll just give you a perspective. Uh, I think as many of us should be out and proud as possible. Uh, I, I think it's, uh, but what what I even what even puts me off is when someone walks in and they are so atheist mm. that you're talking about unrelated things. You know, they're like, "How about those cowboys?" Uh, yeah. By the way, do you know that I'm an atheist and I think God's a bunch of crap? I mean, you, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> I think I like it when it happens more organically. Um, I also like it when people get to know me personally a little bit before we start talking about the deeper things in life, you know. So it's, if someone gets to know me and they're like, hey, that Seth's a nice guy and, he, you know, we really enjoyed time. And then in a week, two weeks, they find out after that, oh, wait a minute, he's, he's an atheist. It's harder to put me in a box and walk away. 
Um, there are some people who cannot because they will, you know, their employers will find a reason to fire them or their parents will kick them out of the house or they will, you know, they're worried about uh, their marriage and the custody of the kids and this stuff's real. And so I never shame anybody for, for playing a longer game. Uh, only you can determine the cost benefit on that. Um, don't shame, don't feel guilt or shame or like you're a coward if you don't. If you feel like the cons I might lose my job, I might get demoted, they might make my life such a hell that at this measure I'm just not quite there. That's legitimate. I know Silverman and I might disagree a little bit on that. He's more of a fuck him. Tell him you're an atheist. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe he's right. I don't know. But I, I, I'm a little bit more of a chess player. And, uh, and don't beat yourself up. I hosted the Thinking Atheist website for two years and the radio show for one year without showing my face because I was still navigating out of a Christian job. And I was terrified. What happens if in, in, at this time of my life, I can't pay the house payment, I can't pay the, I can't pay the bills, I don't know what else to do with my life, I'm, so lo I'm long enough in the tooth to go back to school from square one, what am I gonna do? I was up nights, my gut was in a knot. I, I, my whole world hadn't been turned upside down, really it had been turned right side up, right? But um, it took me years. Dan Barker preached in the pulpit for two years before he managed to get out, and now he's the president of Freedom From Religion Foundation. If you're playing a longer game, it's cool. But at the end of the day, my hope is, is that you always have the goal of being able to be who you are at the volume you choose. And if that's atheist, good for you, okay? All right. We'll do these three, and then we'll, uh, then I'll let you guys stretch and get on with your, your lunch. Go ahead, sir. My name is Robert. Hi. Nice to meet you. Um, first off, I want to say thank you for introducing me to the movement. Um, I started listening to your podcast a couple of years ago. Thank you. Speaking of your, uh, speaking of podcasts, though, what do you, uh, what kind of advice do you have for fledgling podcasters? Well, it's tougher now than it was uh, years ago. You know, now you're a needle in a stack of needles. There's, I mean, how many times have you met an activist and they're like, you know, I've got a podcast. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, you know, because, and I'm honestly delighted. Coming from corporate radio, FM, AM, FM radio, it used to be the domain of big money. These corporations would go in and they would own broadcasting. And you had to have a license from the FCC and you had to have a shit ton of money. And it was just, you had consultants telling you what to say. And all of a sudden the internet and online, internet radio changes everything. It changed everything so that now Anybody, anywhere, we, we all have a voice. If we have something to say, we have a conduit to say it. Now, sometimes the problem is we all have a voice. <laughs> <laughs> but um, mostly uh, my advice to you would be play to your gifts, whatever they are. I mean, there are some people who want to be podcasters, and they may not be gifted communicators verbally, but maybe they're good writers. Um, try to incorporate stories. People love to, to go on a journey try to relate to people, and radio we call it a relate. If I do a speech about something that's important to me and none of you care, I've lost you. And um, try to stay positive. And, and I don't see as much of that as I would like. I'm not looking at happy, clappy, you know, Willy Wonka positive, that sort of Mentos commercial positive that I'm, I'm not talking about faking it. But Jesus Christ, I, am so, I, I hear so much negativity out of you know, the internet. Negativity is the oxygen of the internet. And I just think, you know, I, I really do think, there, there was an old saying that we learned in, when I was uh, in, the, in the faith, and I actually think it's true for real. It's one of those where broken clock is right twice a day things that happens to be true for real life. People don't give to need as much as they give to vision. People don't buy into, we got a problem, 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 the world sucks. As much as they get into, we have a legitimate problem, but you know what? We are going to band together and we're gonna do this and we're gonna create this and we're gonna to come together as human beings and solve the problem. Would you like to be a part of the vision of doing that? Well, hell yeah. If you gave me the choice between A and B, I wanna be part of something positive. I'm gonna create, not just destroy. So tell us some stories, stay positive, play to your strengths and best wishes, okay? Thank you. All right. Hey Seth, I'm Steven and I uh, just wanna say thanks for bringing us along on your journey. Many Thank of us you. like you. In the 30s go through the same thing and I remember you talking about the emotions as you come out of it and you're just angry and then you go after a few years and you're just like okay I'm settled down now but now what can I do and so as you hit this milestone uh, that you're celebrating um, uh, I, first time I've ever met you and I know I hear this all the time people call in and all your other shows and things like that it's uh, it feels like I know you 
And, uh, and coming here, this is my first conference. I feel like I know a lot of these people that I'm meeting for the first time. So uh, if I could ask a personal question is, as you reach this milestone, what do you, uh, what do you wanna do next with not only the thinking atheist, but also you, just a fun, wanna get to know you more. You hit 50, now what? As like learning a language, you wanna fly a plane? Well, I wanna know what Seth's thinking. <laughs> What do I do next? You, should, you all have fun. <laughs> I'll do the show probably as long as people care and keep listening. I'm, I'm fortunate. I, I'm not. People ask me what the, the secret is to the success of the show, and I think there's probably a hundred things. Um, but uh, I, I, I still love it, and anyone who's an activist kind of knows, like, I, I need it. I need to do this. Um, but balance is hard for activists. Do you guys know how, how that goes? I mean, self-care is hard. You know, Natalie will often see me, I'm like, I just need to run up and I need to do an export and I need to hit an edit. It'll be five minutes. But she knows it's like five football minutes, which means I'll be gone for two hours. <laughs> is it five minutes or are you going to be gone? I'm going to make other plans. I'll see. No, 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 I'll be five minutes. And uh, you punish yourself when you're not activism, doing activism-related work. And so I've, uh, I've made a pact with myself here to try to, Nat calls it bubblegum for the brain. Everybody needs it, right? Just something to be able to relax and de decompress. I, I game a little bit. Uh, anybody here listen to the October Ghost Stories broadcast? Anybody here? Okay. Well, I hope this doesn't sound bad. but. I listen online, I don't, I don't have time to listen to a lot of content, but I went and listened to some other ghost stories shows. And most of them suck. <laughs> <They're>, <laughs> and all they found was an iron hook. I mean, that's all they do. And there's not any timing or the music's cheesy. And you guys kind of know my, if you've heard the ghost stories thing, I, I encourage everybody, shut the lights off. And I try to create an environment, and I'm pretty good at it, where you are in your own head. And if you don't get goosebumps at least twice, I haven't done my job. And so after putting all of that, I mean, I put so much time into the, to the ghost stories podcast that I released to everybody, everybody, free. I'm taking some of the best stories and I'm writing five brand new ones, and I'm working on a ghost stories audiobook for audible.com for release in September of this year. And um, so it will hopefully open things up to an audience that, you know, the podcast audience is gonna be like, Psst, you can hear half this shit on the radio for free, folks. <laughs> but I'm hoping that, you know, other people who are searching that stuff in October will lock onto it. It'll provide a revenue stream for my family. It's different, it's something different to talk about and do, and uh, it's a nice distraction, and it allows the other stuff to continue to stay fresh. You know, they've got that bubble gum for the brain. Uh, beyond that, so, you know, I'm, I've got no complaints. Natalie is a, a beaut, she's here with me. She is uh, the joy of my life. She is just a, a gift to someone like me. It's funny, we disagree on areas of spirituality sometimes, but our value systems are the same. She's, she loves people. She wants to love other people. She wants not to judge and not to tear people down. She wants a better humanity. She wants peace. She wants goodness. And uh, when it comes to me, while so many other people are like, this is not how we raised you. This is not who you are. Natalie says, go be whoever you are, and I support you 100%. And I, just, I wouldn't trade her for the world. So. <laughs> to you all the time. Thank you. Um, this is kind of piggybacking on the, you know, family problems, and it's more of a plug and a thank you than a question. Um, one, I would plug uh, the Secular Therapist Project. Um, anyone who has gone through or is going through um, that difficult time, I personally found a lot of help with that. Um, and, you know, for the first time in my life after I don't know how many, you know, very like, you just got to bring yourself back to Jesus uh, therapist that I found. Um, I finally found one that was like, no, who are you? Um, but beyond that, uh, you hear a lot about, you know, blood is thicker than water. 
I call bullshit um, because if they won't at least settle their own issues to keep um, a healthy relationship with you, then fuck them. <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, here is your family. Okay, That's well, great. thank you, thank you. Uh, let me speak to that to close it up, and I know everybody here wants to eat and do your thing, but can you give me 90 seconds? Will you indulge me one last time? Um, you know, like, anybody know somebody who would see a group like this and go, y'all are having atheist church? <laughs> because, you know, when you're taught to frame everything in religious language, the idea of us having something in common and coming together to celebrate like interests, well, that's automatically a religious exercise. And what it does is, is that it, it tells, the church is claiming ownership of something that human beings do naturally. And so I'm always, uh, there are, you'll see some atheists who've been so damaged, their perceptions are so damaged by the church, and I understand it, that they're like, I, I left one church, there's no way I want to stand, go to another, I'm not group think, I'm not going to surrender my individuality, and I always taught them, say, wait a minute. You know, get the people in this room to agree on anything, <laughs> right? I mean, you haven't surrendered your individuality, but you come together. We sharpen each other's knives. We challenge each other. We create relationships, and we're more effective in many ways together as a group. And so I, I'm tired of surrendering to the church what human beings did long before the church, which was to come together to try to affect positive change and to build each other up. You know, I'm, I'm struck when you talk about family. You're right. You know, Matt Delahunty's birthday is today. Matt's my brother. I would have never known him. I would have never known he existed 15 years ago. A woman named Peggy from Wichita is part of the group uh, up there. She's like family to me whenever I see her. Brian Fields from Pennsylvania. He's the one who helped inspire the big effort we're doing tomorrow to help give, feed homeless people, to feed needy people. Um, I, I look all around. You know, Yvette Dontremont, the Psy Babe. Just a force of nature. Well, I would have probably never even known that existed. I would have never known uh, Mandisa Thomas, who I expect to hug from every time I see her, <laughs> everywhere I go, because she's my family. And I think, you know, you're right. Sometimes whenever they make it a requirement, when, when they make it impossible for you to live without the injection of negativity, blood or no blood, you have every right to draw a line, draw a boundary, in your own circle and decide whether or not you will allow that negativity over your threshold and you can tell them we can agree to disagree on this and we can still be family but if you continue if you continue if you continue i have no choice and then at that moment the tragic moment family becomes again the family you choose you know what that's like and in many ways i know what that's like and i honestly i'm glad to have you you all are the family i choose thank you, thank you.